For his alleged past corrupt dealings, the question now, how long will he have his freedom as investigators are expected to seek an arrest warrant very soon? The government is set to announce new measures aimed at helping young Koreans find high-quality jobs. It comes as the youth unemployment rate remains depressingly high. Plus, the British government ejects almost two dozen Russian diplomats from the UK. Tensions threaten to boil over after London accused Moscow of poisoning a former Russian spy with nerve agent on British soil. One story dominating the news today, and that's the man known simply as MB2 Koreans. Prosecutors have wrapped up their questioning of former President Im Yong bak on a slew of corruption and bribery allegations. It's now a nervous wait for the ex-leader, as it seems almost certain the prosecution will seek a warrant for his arrest, given the mountain of evidence they've built up against him. Oh Jung-hee starts us off. After 21 hours at the prosecution complex, former President Im Young bak headed out of the building early Thursday morning. On his way out, he didn't make any special remarks to the press, but left a brief goodbye to prosecution officials. <laughs> The former president arrived at the prosecutor's office Wednesday morning a little before 9.30 a.m., and the interrogation began at around 10. It lasted for 14 hours and ended just before midnight, but Lee had to wait several more hours for prosecutors to review the interrogation record. He faces around 20 allegations, including bribery, embezzlement and abuse of power. Lee was questioned on the auto parts manufacturing company DAS, through which prosecutors say Lee created slush funds and which he allegedly holds the largest stake in under false names. Lee was also asked about using state power for a lawsuit in the U.S. that involved DAS and about receiving money from Samsung for that lawsuit, as well as him and his aides receiving illicit money from the nation's intelligence agency and other businesses. According to the prosecutors, Lee seemed perplexed and surprised when they showed him specific pieces of evidence on his charges. But he still denied most of the allegations, and prosecutors say there is basically no single allegation Lee admits to being guilty of. His answers during the questioning were mostly, I don't know, or my officials or aides must have done it. Prosecutors do not plan on calling him in again because Lee is a former president. Considering that Lee denies all the allegations and so could try to destroy evidence, there's a greater voice within the prosecution that an arrest warrant has to be sought for the former president. It's expected that the decision will be made in the coming days, possibly even before the weekend. Oh jung Arirang News. The government is announcing new measures today aimed at getting more young Koreans into high-quality jobs. The finance ministry says it's considering granting allowances to young job seekers and even using the supplementary budget to try and drag down the high rate of youth unemployment. The plans will be laid out by the finance minister at 4 p.m. today. Our Kim mo reports. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance is worried that February's slowdown in the number of new jobs created might continue in March. According to Yonhap News Agency, an official from the ministry said that there is a possibility that the unemployment rate for March will increase, adding that the ministry will come up with a solution using all available measures such as the budget, finance and tax systems. Speaking to reporters on Tuesday, the nation's finance minister Kim dong yeon also showed enthusiasm for a supplementary budget. He said that the final decision would likely be made on Thursday when the government will announce its countermeasures to the employment crisis at the presidential office of Chongwade. An economic expert stressed the seriousness of the current employment situation in Korea, adding that there's a high possibility that the government will once again drop a supplementary budget. Because, you know, the, the current government has been already implemented a supplementary budget last year to create uh, more jobs, but uh, no matter you know, how effective the supplementary budget in the past, current government thinks that uh, job creation is so uh, important stage at, at the moment that I think the government will try to implement a new kind of uh, supplementary budget this time. 
Another expert who also shares the same thoughts said that improving the business environment could help solve the crisis in the long run. I think at this point, it is inevitable that the government will try to solve the current unemployment crisis in Korea through a supplementary budget. But since jobs are created by companies, I think what's more important in solving the problem in the long term is to improve the business environment so that firms can afford to create more jobs. Kim mok Arirang News. U.S. President Donald Trump has named conservative economist Larry Kudlow as his new top economic advisor. It's left to be seen how Kudlow, who advocates free trade, will impact Trump's tariff plans. And as President Trump continues his trade war narrative, the EU is urging him to engage in trade talks, not trade war. Kim Hyo-sun reports. CNBC television commentator Larry Kudlow will become the director of the National Economic Council, replacing Gary Kahn, who resigned after opposing President Trump's decision to impose tariffs on imported steel and aluminum. The conservative economist, who also served as an advisor to the Reagan administration, is a supporter of free trade. Therefore, U.S. media is speculating that he could clash with President Trump over tariffs and trade deals. Meanwhile, Trump took to Twitter on Wednesday to say that Washington will not turn a blind eye to unfair trade practices, a message that could be aimed at many U.S. allies, including South Korea and the European Union, for going against his tariff increase and even reviewing whether to file complaints to the World Trade Organization. As President Trump continues his trade war narrative, the EU is urging Washington to revive trade talks rather than initiating a trade war. It strongly criticized his decision to impose tariffs, saying it undermines long-standing transatlantic ties and added that the economic bloc is preparing potential countermeasures against American goods. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. Seoul's National Security Advisor and Special Presidential Envoy is back home today from Russia following his meetings on the recent North Korea-related developments. During his stay, Jong Yong sat down with Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, where the two discussed Jong's meetings with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump. Russia was the last stop on President Moon Jae-in's international campaign to rally support for his administration's plan to engage North Korea. And South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang kyung hwa is heading to Washington today as scheduled, despite the surprise dismissal of U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. The Foreign Ministry confirmed that the three-day visit remains on, as the two allies agreed on the need to maintain close contact due to the ongoing diplomacy with North Korea. Following a request by the Trump administration, Kang will meet with the Deputy Secretary John Sullivan instead. They're expected to lay the groundwork for their respective summits on North Korea, as well as President Trump's controversial tariff plans. Now, it has emerged that the European Parliament has been holding secret talks with North Korea since 2015 in a bid to persuade the regime to end its nuclear programme. A delegation led by a British lawmaker, Neely Diva, met with senior North Korean officials 14 times during that period and reportedly plans to hold another meeting in Brussels in the near future. The same lawmaker added they also met with officials from South Korea, the US, China and Japan. Now, today, March 15th, marks one year since China started taking economic retaliation against South Korea for Seoul's decision to deploy a U.S. missile defense system in the country. The ban was lifted late last year, but South Korea's tourism market and South Korean companies operating in China are still feeling the pinch. Lee Sung Jae reports. March 15th marks one year since Beijing imposed retaliatory measures on South Korean goods and tourism after Seoul deployed the U.S. THAAD missile defense system to better cope with North Korea's missile and nuclear threats. Since President Moon Jae-in took office in May last year, the South Korean government has been urging its biggest trading partner to stop its economic retaliation. And in October of last year, the two countries agreed to get their relations back on track with President Moon making a state visit to Beijing for a summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping in December. Despite the improved ties between the two nations, there's been little sign of a breakthrough. Among the most heavily impacted firms is Lotte Group, 
Its chemical unit has seen one of its offices in China shut and sit idle for a year. And since chemical and retail are Lotte's biggest money spinners, it's a huge blow to the nation's fifth largest conglomerate, which saw 87 of its 99 Lotte March stores across China suspend operations last year after the firm offered its golf course in Sengju to be used as the site for the Thad battery. South Korea's tourism sector has also taken a huge hit. According to the Korea Tourism Organization, the number of inbound Chinese tourists fell by more than 48 percent compared to 2016. From March to December 2016, the number of Chinese tourists to South Korea was close to 7 million, but from March to December of 2017, it barely surpassed 3 million. This also contributed to the drop in the overall number of foreigners who visited South Korea, down more than 22 percent from a year earlier. The fall in tourism also impacted duty-free stores, despite sales reaching an all-time high last year. Small-scale Chinese traders increased duty-free sales growth, but discount sales due to competition led to an almost 88 percent drop in profits for Lotte duty-free and more than 25 percent decrease for Shila duty-free. But with improved ties with China and the spring season having arrived in South Korea, the country hopes to see Chinese tourists return to boost the tourism market once again. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Now, South Korea has ranked 57th on the UN's 2018 World Happiness Report, scoring just under 5.9 out of 10. Finland was found to be the happiest nation in the world, followed by Norway, Denmark and Iceland. The report, which ranks 156 countries on six variables that support well-being, including income, freedom, trust and healthy life expectancy, was released ahead of World Happiness Day on March 20th. Korean tennis star Jung Hyun has advanced to the quarterfinals of the Indian Wells Masters in California. The 21-year-old defeated Uruguay's Pablo Cuevas in the fourth round on Wednesday. He will play the winner of the match between Roger Federer and Francis Jeremy Chardy, who is currently about 100th in the rankings. Jung, who is currently world 26, is expected to move up to 23rd. With Wednesday's win, Jung has become Korea's latest sports sensation after his run to the semi-finals of this year's Australian Open. Now for a look at stories making headlines around the world. And we're going to start with the worsening relations between Britain and Russia. British Prime Minister Theresa May has announced a slew of measures against Moscow after the poisoning of a former Russian spy on British soil. For more on this, we turn to our Noah Adam. Uh, so, Adam, if you wouldn't mind, please run us through the latest developments. Yes, Mark. Uh, May had warned of punitive measures if Moscow did not explain how a Soviet-era nerve agent was used to poison a former Russian double agent and his daughter in Salisbury. Russia had until Tuesday midnight UK time to respond, but it refused. This part made to act, and she told Parliament on Wednesday that London would expel 23 Russian diplomats. Under the Vienna Convention... The United Kingdom will now expel 23 Russian diplomats who have been identified as undeclared intelligence officers. They have just one week to leave. This will be the single biggest expulsion for over 30 years, and it reflects the fact that this is not the first time that the Russian state has acted against our country. She didn't end there as she announced more measures against Russia while painting a gloomy picture for British and Russian ties. But in the aftermath of this appalling act against our country, this relationship cannot be the same. So we will suspend all planned high-level bilateral contacts between the United Kingdom and the Russian Federation. This includes revoking the invitation to Foreign Minister Lavrov to pay a reciprocal visit to the UK and confirming there will be no attendance by ministers or indeed members of the royal family at this summer's World Cup in Russia. Russia has repeatedly denied involvement and Moscow's foreign ministry said it would swiftly retaliate against the British measures. It said they had been undertaken for what it called short-sighted political ends at, uh, for short-sighted political ends. At the UN Security Council, the Russian ambassador to the UN again denied Russian involvement and demanded the UK to provide material proof in accordance with international law. 
Meanwhile, many of Britain's allies have shown their support for London, with the EU and the United States, among others, expressing solidarity. Angela Merkel has been sworn in for a fourth term as German Chancellor after a close vote on Wednesday by Germany's parliament. Since the national popular election last September, Merkel has struggled to form a coalition to form a government, but eventually joined forces with the Social Democrats. However, she still faces resistance from SPD members, many of whom are still unhappy with the prospect of another four years of a grand coalition. Merkel embarks on her fourth term amid a fractious European Union as well as, as well as a potential trade war with an increasingly protectionist United States. Tributes from around the world have poured in for Stephen Hawking. He died peacefully at his home in Cambridge on Wednesday at the age of 76. Scientists and world leaders honoured the British physicists through social media. British Prime Minister Theresa May described him as one of the great scientists of his generation and that his legacy will not be forgotten. American astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted that Hawking's death left an intellectual vacuum in his wake. NASA tweeted that his theories unlocked a universe of possibilities that the agency and the world are exploring. Known for his theories on black holes and relativity, Hawking died 54 years after he was told he would only have a few years to live due to Lou Gehrig's disease. So let's turn our focus to the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Paralympics. South Korea's mixed wheelchair curling team is closing in on the semi-finals, coming off a 9-2 loss against Norway on Wednesday afternoon. The host nation beat Sweden 4-2 in the evening. South Korea is in second place alongside Canada with two more matches left in the qualifying round. The round-robin matches will wrap up today with the semi-finals taking place on Friday. The medal matches happen on Saturday. Shifting our focus to the ice hockey now, and South Korea is hoping to bounce back from its 8-0 loss against the USA earlier this week, but they face a massive challenge. World number one Canada in the semi-finals later today. Despite losing all their 16 matches against Canada since 2012, the host nation will be looking to pull off a shock home victory in the clash that begins at noon Korea time. South Korea finished the group stage with two wins and one loss. Canada topped their group, scoring 35 goals without letting in any at their end. Now, spearheading the historic charge for South Korea's ice hockey team at the Paralympics is Jong Sung Hwan, a player the team just cannot do without. Uh, Lee Jung Yan gets us better acquainted with the star forward. Korea, for the first time in Paralympics history, has secured a ticket to the Para Ice Hockey semifinals. Although the Korean team was defeated by the U.S. on Tuesday, its consecutive victories against Japan and the Czech Republic were enough to classify the team as a runner-up to the semifinals. The team's star forward, Chong seung -hwan, scored both goals against the Czech Republic, making an impressive goal just 13 seconds into sudden death. Known as the Messi on ice for his noticeable speed, Chong led the South Korean team to the silver medal at the 2012 Para Ice Hockey World Championships and gold at the 2013 Para Ice Hockey Qualification Tournament in Italy. With such track record, the Korean sledge hockey player has been in the global spotlight even before the Pyeongchang Paralympics started. He didn't set out to be an athlete from the start, however. He only started sledge hockey when he was in college after being mesmerized by the sport when he tagged along to watch a game with his friend. His family recounted their initial skepticism when he started playing. I was sort of against it at first because we were all worried about him getting injured. We didn't know much about the sport either. Chong lost his right leg when he was five when construction pipes collapsed onto his leg. His mom still vividly remembers the weekend of the accident. It really broke my heart. We ran around frantically to four different hospitals, but in the end, they all said the leg needed to be amputated. But she says how she treated Chong after the incident was probably what fortified his character and made the individual he is today. I cried every day in the inside, but I never showed it. 
I treated him exactly the way I treated his siblings and didn't give him any special treatment. It was only after the star player's recent post on social media, an honest account of his childhood, when he thought there was no hope, no future, that his family realized how much he actually went through internally. He was always a bright person. He didn't want us to worry, so he never showed signs of being stressed out due to his disability. Although Chong is the youngest out of three siblings, his sister says he's more of a big brother for her, someone she can rely on all the time. He's a way stronger person than we had ever imagined, so I just hope he keeps doing what he's doing and has good influence in society. Chung Soo-won said in an interview on the opening day of the games that a bigger goal than winning a medal is to give hope to those who feel at a disadvantage. Regardless of the final outcome of this year's games, his fans and family have no doubts he has already achieved that goal. Lee jong Arirang News. Now, the North Korean Winter Paralympics delegation will return home on this Thursday after making their historic debut in the Winter Paralympics in Pyeongchang. Cross-country skiers Ma Yu Chol and Kim Jong-hyun will be among the 20-member delegation that heads north of the border today. Ma and Kim took part in their final competition on Wednesday in the men's cross-country 1.1-kilometer sitting sprint event. With that, let's take a look at the medal standings and the schedule for the rest of the day. Good morning. Most areas have been seeing some welcome showers since last night, and southern coastal region in Jeju will see the most rainfall will up to 60 millimeters throughout the day, while eastern regions will see rain until Friday, but Seoul will see showers letting up in the mid-afternoon. Now it's going to feel cooler than yesterday with highs dropping nearly 7 degrees in Seoul. Topping out at 14 degrees this afternoon, Daegu will make it to 17 degrees this afternoon. And temperatures will drop a few notches further and morning lows will drop down to the lower single digits, which is the seasonal averages. With that, let's take a look at the international weather for beers around the world. Well, most regions in South Korea will have rain to ease the drought. Many parts of North Korea will also see rain or even snow further up north. And as for the rest of Asia, unseasonably warm temperatures in Beijing came to an end as well. And sub-zero morning lows will hike up to 12 degrees this afternoon. Meanwhile, Sydney is in for some fine weather with blue skies and sunshine after coping a drenching from heavy rainfall over the last two days. And heading to North America, the cold weather in Washington, D.C. has slowed down the progress of cherry blossoms toward their peak blue. And as for South America, Rio de Janeiro will be dealing with sweltering heat and sunny skies at a high of 36 degrees Celsius. And taking you to Europe, major cities will have mostly sun to snow depending on the region. And lastly, to Africa, Addis Ababa and Algiers will have a rainy Thursday. And that's all the weather update for now. And that's where we're going to leave the news for now as well. Our next bulletin is coming up at noon, Korea Times. So until then, goodbye.